I never saw Linda and Lula have disagreements. They always got along. We lived a suburban dream. Friendly neighbors, happy kids, and unlocked doors. We don't have homicides, especially in my circle of friends. What made this case stand out is the evilness of it. I never would have thought that she could have done something like that. It says right there in the Bible, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Be careful who you trust, because it could cost you your life. A fireman goes out and does their job, and there are certain calls that will forever be in their memory. I mean, I'll never forget that that fire, ever. About 5.30 in the morning, the fire department was dispatched to a structure fire. On the way to the fire, I reported heavy smoke showing, and we weren't even in the neighborhood yet. I'd seen some fire, and I'd seen some houses that had a lot of fire damage to them, but nothing that was this hot this fast. Basically, two-thirds of the house was on fire. That's all you could see was just fire everywhere. When I went through the bedroom window, I had one thing on my mind, and that was to find the person that lives in the house. And I found her at the foot of the bed between the, the bed and the wall. You always hope there's a chance, but in the back of my mind, I knew there was, there was no way. There was just too much heat and smoke in that house. There was just no way. We both knew this house well. It was filled with happy moments and cherished memories. When I found out that it was a friend that did it, I mean, that was really hard. It was like, how can you do that? It just doesn't make sense. It's still hard for me to make sense of it all. But envy and greed, they can burn a friendship up from the inside. Lula and Linda had lived next door to each other uh, probably for 10, 15 years. They were best friends, and it, it ended so badly. The streets we lived on witnessed it all, back to the very beginning. We were closer than sisters, living next door, raising our families side by side. I learned early on that with hard work and an education, anything is possible. Linda come from what I understand is a well-to-do family. She came from Selmer, Tennessee. She had gotten her nursing degree and she had worked in, in nursing for quite some time. I was a good nurse. Helping people was like second nature to me. But hospital hours are tough, and I barely saw my husband. He was a truck driver, and he was gone a lot. He would come home during the week a couple of times, take a shower, but he would be home for 12, 24 hours, and then he'd be gone again. Gary would be on the road for days at a time. So once the girls were born, I needed a job I could do from home. Her father was, was uh, in the financial business and she pretty much followed in his footsteps. Linda had a pretty good head on her shoulders as far as work. She decided to have an accounting degree and she did taxes. She wasn't happy. She was a person that uh, you could have a funny conversation with, uh, lots of laughs. 
I moved to the neighborhood first with my husband and two girls in tow. But when I met the other moms on the block, I could take them or leave them. Linda was not one to dress up. She didn't wear makeup and fix her hair and wear nice clothes and that type of thing. She was pretty much down to earth, the natural look. Linda wasn't fancy, even though she could afford to be. As for me, I was anything but fancy. Lola, she was my oldest sister. We was a happy family. We didn't have a whole lot, but we was happy. Daddy worked with his hands, and he was real good at fixing things. We'd all pack up and go wherever his work would take him. We always moved between Mississippi and Arkansas, just back and forth. Never lived anywhere more than probably a year. <laughs> By the time I was 12 years old, I'd picked out the boy I was gonna marry. And I wouldn't let anything stand in my way. She started going to college, she decided to marry and have a family and followed, followed him. They had two children, a boy and a girl. Lula's husband was a construction worker and of course he moved around a good bit, but he always worked, he always had a decent job. We bounced around for a while but then we found this nice neighborhood in Horn Lake, Mississippi. Horn Lake was really a small town. Neighbors knew neighbors and actually talked to people. People weren't in a hurry to go places. It was the days when you could go outside and sit in a circle with your neighbors and you'd see kids playing in the streets. And I would call it just a very, very typical American happy neighborhood. All our saving and planning it paid off. It wasn't no dream house, but it was ours. We went and helped them move to Horn Lake, and we got in about 2 o'clock one morning, I guess, threw a mattress on the floor and just made the night there, you know. And the next morning, Linda was the first one to come and tell her, we're so glad to have you in the neighborhood. I was new to town, and Linda was a bit of a black sheep. Neither one of us really fit in. Linda introduced herself and told her she had two children and said, I think we're going to be good friends. And they were. When you move into a neighborhood, everybody wants to know their neighbors, especially when you live in a cove. That was our safe haven, that little cove. Some folks call it a cul-de-sac. Lula and I called it heaven. The children play out there together. You'd be out there watching them play, you'd get to talking. Linda and Lula both smoked. They would drink coffee and smoke cigarettes. They just seemed to be at like they were meant to be friends. Since both our husbands traveled a lot for work, we pretty quickly learned to rely on each other. And you know, Lula moved around all her life so that was the first time she had been solid with a good friend, you know. And uh, it, it was just something she'd never experienced before. You would almost think they were sisters because they would do anything for each other. It was amazing. Her and Linda probably got along better than me and Lula did. <laughs> Neither one of them met a stranger. Linda or Lula, they would go out grocery shopping and come back talking about people that they had talked to in the grocery store. So they were very outgoing, had a lot of fun when they were together. Those first few years were some of the happiest of my life. I had a new best friend, someone smart from a good family. Lula and Linda would go to movies together, they would shop together, cook together, just the typical things that two really close friends would do. Pretty soon, Lula got to be like my shadow. Our kids even used to joke that they had two moms, that if one of us didn't catch them doing something wrong, the other always would. But for Lula and her family, the good times were running out. Lula's husband started spending more time away from home he was seeing other women, and he eventually did leave her for a, another lady to raise the two children on her own. When Lula's husband left her, she was 
devastated. She was the type that when she got married, it was for life and she expected him to be able to take care of her and the two children. And when that didn't happen, um, I think she was just totally devastated. Just like that, my marriage had gone up in smoke. It was just me and the kids now. For Lula, after her husband left, it really did change a lot for her because she had never been a person who had to work and make a living. So everything that they'd ever done financially had been strictly through his name. In the work field, that's, that's one of the things people look at. You don't have a credit reference, you don't have a job reference behind you. And it really made it hard for her to start with for Lula to get a job. I was used to just scraping by, but when it came to the children, I'd be damned if they was to go without. I felt terrible for Lula, so I did what friends do. I offered to help. I needed a friend to share my pain, but Linda had the good life. She never wanted for anything. What did she know about losing it all? Linda and I were the best of friends. Until a fire burned one of our homes to the ground. See, when the firefighters got there, they located a single white female in the bedroom in the house. The victim was in her 40s. The cause of death was basically smoke inhalation. Things just didn't add up. The way the fire was burning, the intensity of it, the amount of heat that it was producing, that house shouldn't have got that well involved that quick at that time of the morning. The thing that really stuck out for us was the location of the propane bottle next to the space heater. People just don't keep propane tanks in the middle of their living room floor. It wasn't even by a back door, it was in the middle of the floor. When the firefighters found it, the propane bottle was over in the open position. So that made it very, very suspicious. When you have something like this, you really don't think that this is a homicide. But as time went on, it became pretty obvious that the origin of fire had occurred right there where the propane bottle was. It was obvious to us that whoever did this knew what they were doing. Long before the fire, in the months after my husband left, I struggled through some dark days. Lula had to watch her finances pretty close and watch every penny. There was no going out and buying a new dress for a party or anything like that. My best friend was none too familiar with these kinds of troubles. Linda and her husband's finances were, were much better. Linda had a decent job doing people's taxes. It always seemed like Linda was living on Easy Street, I guess you say. She was doing well. Everything looked good for her. And uh, I mean, she would even pay Lula to come and clean her house. Linda rubbed a lot of folks the wrong way. But I got along with her just fine. I think they were able to share a lot of time together, keep each other from being lonely, and they became very close. I feel like Lula's and Linda's friendship becomes stronger after their divorce because Lula needed somebody more to lean on at that time. Linda was the strong one of the two. She was very strong-willed, very. Maybe it was her years as a nurse, but Linda was somebody who'd stand up for you, who always got the job done. All right, sound good? Okay, thank you. I think Lula looked up to Linda because she was educated, she was smart, um, she had her own business. Sometimes I got along with my neighbor's money better than I got along with my neighbors. Even folks who looked down on the way I looked or dressed started asking about deductions this and exemptions that. And they'd come to Lula for help with, well, everything else. 
people in the cove knew that Lula was home during the day. If they needed anything, they knew to ask Lula. I remember one time my oldest had the chicken box and I had to go to work. But you couldn't take him to daycare because he had the chicken box. So Lula stayed during the day. Lula helped everybody. Whatever she could do, she would do. Lula came off as so sweet, but she had a tough side. I'm not gonna say we didn't have some tussles and rounds, because we did. <laughs> she was always the one that was gonna boss me, you know. And uh, me being younger, of course, back then a lot, a lot smaller. <laughs> she, uh, she thought she could uh, handle me. Linda didn't take any bull either. Guess we had that in common. Linda really was kind of a bully in a way. If she didn't think something was right, she would let you know about it and she would take it to the extreme. Lula and Linda were both very outspoken. I guess that's why they took each other so well. Maybe they understood each other. <laughs> you know, where Linda might say something and it might kind of hit me the wrong way, uh, Lula would say, oh, she didn't mean nothing with that, you know. I don't beat around the bush, especially with my best friend. So I told Lula after her husband left, honey, it's time to get a job. Linda used to be a nurse at that big hospital downtown. She pulled some strings and got me a job. Lula worked at Baptist Hospital, but she worked as a secretary for the oncology floor. She loved it. She loved the people she worked with. She loved the patients. She really loved her job. She wanted to learn more. She would ask the nurses about this, ask about medications. She really wanted to learn all she could. I started waking up to what I had been missing, what I was really capable of. Lula wanted to be more involved with the community, so she went to EMT school and became an EMT. I met her through the fire station. Lulu was involved with, with the ambulance side. If somebody needed help, she got dispatched, and she'd get up and come to the fire station, get her ambulance, and she'd go out and help people. I loved going on calls with the fire department boys. I'd been a housewife tied to the home. Now I was in the thick of it. She was very involved. She took shifts, signed up to ride a couple of nights a week. And then if anybody couldn't do their shift, they could ask Lula and she would gladly take their shift for them. And I'm sure she had attended fire safety courses that they had put on at the fire station. She was knowledgeable about the fire safety, about the consequences of fire, the effects of fire on people and, and their property. So she was very knowledgeable about, about all that. Soon enough, I knew firsthand about fires, how they start and how destructive they can be. And I had to admit, it was all thanks to Linda. I was happy for Lula, but I had some big news to share with her, and I wasn't sure how she'd take it. Linda decided that she wanted a bigger house, and they built a nice big house, which was about probably five or 10 minutes away. I think when Linda moved, um, Lula had a sense of being lonely that her best friend wasn't right next door. In a way, she felt like she'd lost a friend because she wasn't right there with her, you know. I think she felt a little bit abandoned, I guess you'd say. <laughs> First, my husband leaves, and now, Linda, I was the one left behind again. But there was one way to stay closer than ever. Linda and I were about to become business partners, and that would change everything. I sometimes wondered how a country girl like me could be best friends with someone like Linda, an accountant's daughter with her own tax business. Lula was my closest friend in the world, but she had to understand my family came first. 
Linda actually moved into a fairly large house with her family. Linda wanted a bigger, nicer house. She wanted to keep up with the Joneses. She wanted to be somebody. Linda had been there from day one, you know, since Lula came into that cove. And then all of a sudden, Linda's up moving away from her. Linda had opened my eyes to a bigger and better world, and I wasn't about to let that go. After Linda moved, I know they talked to each other on the phone daily. I would see Linda's car come over to Lula's to visit, um, and I'm sure that Lula uh, would go over and visit with Linda some too. It was told to us by numerous people that they were just like sisters. Lula had her two children. Linda had her children. The kids could come over to Linda's house. Linda's kids could go over to Lula's house, and they were just like family whenever they went in. Lula and the kids treated my new house like it was their own. One year, Lula spent the Thanksgiving holiday with Linda and her family. Our friendship was never stronger. Lula had been through tough times, but we got through them together. They had a, what they called a little cleaning business at the time. L Home Health Care, that's what we called it. Lula was so good at cleaning my house, we figured to make some money on top of our day jobs. We drew up a contract and everything to make it official. It covered the basics, even what would happen if, heaven forbid, one of us died. They had a life insurance policy. That's the kind of thing they did to protect the other one in the business if something happened to one of them. Lula done the biggest part of the, the cleaning work, and Linda done a lot of getting the jobs. Everyone said Lula did the hard part, but when someone complained or there were bills to pay, then it was my problem. On top of my tax business, this was a lot for me to take on. But I had someone to help out around the house. Wayne Dunn was a friend of Linda Leadham's daughters. Wayne would work for Linda from time to time. She would give him an opportunity to do odd jobs, run errands and things like that, and she would give him money in return for doing that. Wayne was a strong young man, still in his 20s. And with my husband away a lot and Lula on her own, he was a big help to both of us. And Linda and this Dunn guy were friends. And Lula had met him because he'd been over at Lula's house one time with Linda. He would come over to Linda's house. He would go to Lula's house. He would just hung around the girls and became friends with them. I grew up around lots of country boys like Wayne, but we didn't know his whole story. <laughs> Wayne was a drug addict that had a preference for cocaine, and he was known to us. Uh, we, he was known to the local police department and the DA's office uh, as being someone who was a drug addict. He was just, I think a lot of ways to describe him might be drifter or or um, just somebody lost in life. If you really look at the two families, Wayne seemed to be out of place. Out of place? Maybe. But we paid good money, and Wayne didn't let us down. And we needed all the help we could get. Because Lula was gearing up for the fight of her life. She had called Mama and told Mama, said, I found a knot under my arm, and uh, I'm going to have to go get it checked. I worked in the oncology wing of the hospital, so I knew the signs. It was breast cancer. This was going to be our friendship's biggest test. And in the end, it would tear us apart. So much had changed since Lula and I met. Making new friends, 
trying new jobs. And then this. One day, Lula came over across the yard. The back door was open, and she came in, and um, she said, I got something to tell you. Um, it's going to be OK. I uh, found a lump and went and got it checked out. They're going to do surgery, and that's it. After she found that, she had breast cancer. She took chemo. She took it like once a month, and she would be sick about three weeks out of that month. And by the time she'd get over the sickness, it was time to take chemo again. Even after she was first diagnosed with cancer, she still volunteered. Uh, she still came in and rode the ambulance. I tried to stay busy, and our friend Wayne would lend a hand around the house. But it started to feel like a losing battle. She was a very good mom. She tried her best. When she got sick, though, it, it put a damper on. She didn't have the, the energy to keep up with her kids, you know. I felt powerless, but thank the Lord, I still had my best friend. Linda was there for Lula and gave up her time to take Lula to the doctor take her to her cancer treatments, to see that the kids were, were attended to, to be there as best as she could. She was there for Lula. She'd done a lot to help her at times. She was a neighbor. She was a friend. And she would see that she had groceries when she needed them. When she wasn't able to get them herself, she would go get them for her. She would carry her places. They were good friends before, but I think she needed more help and uh, she really relied on Linda a lot. I knew Lula would do the same for me. We were gonna fight this like we'd done everything since we met, together. Sometimes I wondered what I'd done to deserve a friend like Linda. She even helped me pay the bills when I got too sick to work. I didn't know how I'd ever repay her. Just like you know, a lot of other folks, she was just uh, living paycheck to paycheck. She was getting by. That was all she'd done. She, she got by on what she'd done. Lula was a fighter, but as the bills piled up, it seemed like the cancer kept pulling her backwards. They took off her breast and took all of the lymph nodes and everything under her arm, and then it got to showing up in her spine, in her hip, in her, you know. So she had more cancer than we realized, you know, at first. Chemo made her very sick. She had mentioned to Linda that she knew her health was um, bad and that she didn't want to die um, from the cancer. And then I think it got to be just too much. It got so bad that I feared Lula might do something drastic. That's when I started making plans for my family's future. Lula wanted Linda to be the one to take care of the kids, I had made her power of attorney if anything had ever happened. And everybody knew that. She, she never hid that. You know, if we weren't available, Linda kind of jumped in just like an extra sister, you know. She knew all about Lula's everyday life. She dealt with Lula's everyday life more than we did. So my mom had told Linda, said, I'd rather Lula put you on her insurance policy as beneficiary. Linda had the financial know-how to take care of her own family. In case I didn't make it, I wanted her taking care of mine. And Linda told Lola, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You just tell me what you want done. If you're fighting cancer like I was, it can be hard to qualify for extra life insurance. But Linda found a way around that. Linda actually posed as Lula when the insurance physicals were done. When the 
nurses that conduct the insurance physicals showed up at Linda's house. They thought they were doing a physical on Lily Young when in fact it was Linda Leadham. If they had been able to do a physical examination on Lula, they would have detected the breast cancer immediately and the policies would not have been issued. On the insurance forms, they asked how we were connected. I wrote sister. Everyone said how lucky I was to have Linda. But the more she acted like my nurse, the less she felt like my friend. Linda was a person who always seemed like, regardless what the question was, she had an answer. She was always a person who wanted to be in control of things, it seemed to be. She also wanted to tell Lula how to raise her kids, you know. That's the one thing that they would have little tiffs over. As long as I still had my strength, there wasn't nobody who would tell me how to be a good mother, not even my best friend. And then Lula got a piece of news that changed everything. There was a doctor's appointment earlier in December in which the doctor told her that the cancer had not gotten worse. It was a positive sign. Her cancer was in remission. And she told Mama, she said, Mama, I feel good for the first time in a while. I really feel good. It was like coming out of a fog. I didn't have to rely on Linda all the time. It was time to take charge of my life again. But it could never go back to the way it was. Something had changed while Lula was sick. We weren't the same, and our friends weren't the same. Wayne kind of latched on to the girls and was able to develop a friendship to the extent with them that he became a, a more of, you want to call it, a, a member of the family. He'd drop in all the time. If he wasn't at my house, you sure as heck could find him at Lula's. And I think over time, it was a, an open door relationship between the two families. There was something about that boy, Wayne. Something I could never quite put my finger on. There was an allegation that Wayne was having a relationship with Lula, which was never substantiated. He'd started out as a handyman, but he got to where he knew more and more about our lives until he knew too much. On the night of the fire, Lula was at home and Wayne Dunn came to visit with her. They talked, they visited, Lula went to bed. Linda was at home and she also went to bed. Lula and I had often talked about our dreams. New cars, bigger houses, a fine life for our children. But for those dreams to come true, one of us would have to die. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure if you open a propane tank in a room and put something that's flammable around it, that it will ignite. And that's exactly what happened here. fire went out that morning, Lula's friends at the fire department rushed to respond. When I rounded the corner and saw the house, a shock factor kind of sets in like, oh, oh my God, I know who lives here. I knew that it was Lula Young's house. Most of the neighbors in the cove and some on the surrounding streets had gathered in, in the area. We're asking questions, you know, what's going on? Is she gonna be all right? When I got there, I found out they hadn't gotten her out and that she had died in the fire. Everyone figured it was an accident or an act of desperation. 
We explored the possibility that this could have been a suicide. But Lula wasn't the type of person that would cheat her, her kids out of what time they had left by ending her own life. She never, never talked about, if I don't make it through this, never, never. Lula had been around people that had had fires and had been burned. And the thought of burning to death or can't breathe because of smoke inhalation would have been an awful, an awful notion for her. No, I didn't do this to myself. And only one person in the crowd that morning knew the real story, my best friend, Linda. Linda acted like she was upset, couldn't believe this had happened. It had all started back in the darkest days of my illness. When Lula talked to her about becoming the beneficiary of the small policy that she had, Linda saw an opportunity to benefit from her friend's death. Linda had the mentality, well, she's gonna die anyway. Why can't I get something out of it? Linda was able to obtain insurance policies that paid her and her family. Um, Lula was the insured. Linda was the beneficiary. I knew about the first policy, but then Linda started to get ideas, posing as me to get more and more coverage, and I knew nothing about it. On one of the policies, if it was deemed to be an accident that she died in, then she would have received a uh, million dollars. Once the insurance policies were obtained, Linda began to pay $1,000 a month in premiums. And, and she was basically sitting back waiting on Lula to die. Every month that I kept fighting meant money out of my best friend's pocket. When Lula actually got a decent doctor's report, in the beginning of December of 94, I think Linda's greed took over. Linda didn't like to get her hands dirty, but she knew who could help her. Wayne was a crack addict at the time, and Linda was providing him with money. He needed money, and he did not have much of a conscience. Linda had approached him, asking him to set this fire to make it look like an accident and that he would get paid a sum of money by Linda to do this. Linda had bought a grill that year as a Christmas present and had asked Lula if it was okay to store it at her house so nobody would find it at her house. And it was a grill with a propane tank. Wayne went over to Lula's house. They chatted for a little while. She told him he was welcome to watch TV, but she was going to bed. Wayne went out and got the space heater out of the car, found the propane tank where Linda had left it filled. He went in, put the tank in the middle of the living room, opened it up, put the space heater on the side, plugged it in, cut it on high, and put a piece of newspaper over the space heater and left. I had gone to bed early, and the medications I was taking made me sleep soundly. By the time the fire woke me up, it was already too late. definitely a betrayal, the worst kind. She trusted her with her life and it cost her her life. You always look back then and you wonder if it was a situation that was done. You never know how long these kind of things were planned. It's hard to, to process how supposedly your best friend could go out and do things like that. I mean, that's just wrong. Linda promised to take care of my kids. 
But as the insurance money started coming in, she kept it for herself. She gave the kids a total of $250 a piece. Our immediate suspect, when we learned of the insurance policy, was Linda Leadham. The most difficult part was knowing that we had a very wonderful lady that was murdered and knowing who did it in our minds and not being able to get the proof to show that she did it. For two years, she got away with it. And had it not been for absolutely pure luck, she'd still be out there today. In the end, Linda and I were both done in by the same person, our old friend, Wayne. All of the pieces of the puzzle came together when a former employer of Wayne Dunn told that Dunn had confessed to him that he had burned an old lady up in a house back in December of 94. How could you even thought of the idea to make money off of your best friend's death? I mean, what kind of sick individual does that? People say you can't put a price on friendship, but in this particular case, this friendship was worth a million dollars. I guess that Linda felt like a uh, million dollars or more uh, was worth more than Lula's friendship or her life. Wayne Dunn pled guilty to murder, and he is currently housed at the Mississippi State Penitentiary of Parchman. Uh, Linda was found guilty of conspiracy and murder. She's at the Central Mississippi Correctional Facility in Pearl, Mississippi. Linda will die in prison. One of the most evil people in, in this world, uh, in my opinion, was taken off the streets to where she cannot do this to anybody else. To me, I feel like God is the one that says how long we've got here on earth, and it's nobody else's option to take it away from us. You know, you have things happen in life, and you say, I wish I could have told her about it. I still, when I think about it, I cannot believe that this happened to my next door neighbor, my friend. <laughs>